Hello everybody, hope you're all doing well. My name is Steven and this is the Storytime channel. Today we have some pro revenge stories and our first story of the day is by Lord S. Thor. He punched me over a fender bender. I destroyed his life. I was working as a civilian with the US military overseas and I lived off base in an apartment complex popular among the US military. One morning I accidentally hit another soldier's vehicle. Upon exiting the vehicle, I noticed that both our vehicles were what you could call a hoopty. A hoopty is an old car that is pretty beat up and that has been passed around from service to service member, and they generally sell for $1,000 to $2,000. I also recognized that I was at fault for the accident. It was a very minor accident. His rear bumper was dented in slightly, but I could hear both our cars still running. I approached the driver who had already gotten out and he was in uniform and I apologized and said if it was alright with him, I'd like to negotiate a payment that I will pay him in cash and we don't involve the authorities. I wanted to keep this simple. I'll be honest, the accident was so minor I honestly expected him to say, nah man, it's good, but even if you wanted some money, I'd have paid him. I have always been of the opinion if you have a fender bender and can negotiate agreeable terms between both the parties, it's best to not involve insurance and the police. He told me he wanted to call the police. I said we could call the police or we could go on base together and I could give him $300. He said that wasn't enough, so I upped my offer to $500. He proceeded to punch me in the face. It was a sucker punch. He got into his car and took off and in the process nearly ran me over. Now I had a black box in my car which recorded everything. I went to the provost marshal office on base, the police station, and reported the accident and the assault and showed the MP the footage, which they used his license plate to track him down. I was also asked if I wanted to involve the local authorities slash press criminal charges off base. Honestly, I felt like the soldier would learn his lesson if I let UMCJ, the military court basically, handle this and I said, not at this time. I was told it was an option. The end result was the soldier in question got 60 days extra duty, reduction in rank, and forfeited a portion of his paycheck. Essentially, if he dealt with that, this would have been the end of the whole ordeal. Honestly, at this point I assumed our little ordeal was over. Well, a few days after his punishment was decided on, which was not long after the incident itself, I was in the commissary, grocery store on base, shopping when the soldier who assaulted saw me and began to insult me. I told him that he needed to calm down, that he should learn his lesson. He told me I was a substitute word for a cat starting with P who didn't know how to take a punch. I reminded him that I held back on destroying his life. He told me he's already been punished and I can't touch him again. He left me be. A store employee witnessed the entire encounter and I got the employee detail and reported this interaction to his command. His commander told me he had been ordered to not interact with me and would take action. His commander also recommended me I involve the local authorities since the soldier obviously isn't learning his lesson. So I did. I contacted an attorney. The attorney was unsure if we could successfully sue the soldier and said he would need a cash payment to take the case. Honestly, I was mad and I wanted to teach this guy a lesson. I agreed. It was not cheap. To keep this story short, we ended up in a court off base. We presented our evidence. The soldier in question had decided to represent himself. Several times in the court he had outbursts. The judge ended up granting me a judgment of approximately $50,000 US. When the judgment was given, the soldier called the judge a son of a witch and that the army would cover for him. So the judge changed his judgment to $80,000 and the judge then asked me if I also wanted to press charges against the soldier in criminal court. Honestly, it was obvious this guy wasn't going to learn a lesson. I told the judge I wanted to pursue criminal charges in addition to the judgment. My lawyer later advised me that if I ever wanted to see the money, I should pursue an international hold. With my judgment, it's likely that a judge would grant me an international hold. An international hold is basically where the soldier would not be allowed to leave the country until I was paid my $80,000. Also, he told me that according to the agreement between the US military and the host country, the US military would honor the international hold. 
Basically, the US military would not protect him or move him out of the country to avoid punishment. Honestly, by this point, I had paid my lawyer thousands of dollars and I honestly didn't feel like paying thousands of dollars and getting nothing for it. So I said yes, I want to go forward with the international hold. About a month later, the international hold was granted and the US military was informed of this. Two months after that, the criminal case was over and the soldier was sentenced to 90 days in jail. By this point, the soldier had been moved onto the base into his barracks by his commander. I remember the day I was informed the MPs handed him over to the local authorities to begin his 90-day jail sentence. Did I mention he still owed me $80,000? I heard nothing for a year, and then one day I get a call from his commander. His commander wants me to make a statement in regards to the case. I go in and make the statement. During the statement, I find out the US military was in the process of chaptering the soldier out of the US military. The commander also informed me that he was close to coming up with the money to pay me so he could have the international hold lifted. The commander also asked me if my lawyer would be willing to make a statement. I contacted my lawyer, who also made a statement about the facts of the case. A few weeks later, his ex-wife contacted me. When this all started, I knew he was married, because his wife decided to divorce him. She informed that his ex had the money and needed the details on how to pay me. I provided her the details, and a few days later I got the payment and contacted his ex-wife to inform her I had been paid. She then asked me to send a receipt so he could have the international hold lifted and returned to the States. I asked her how he got the money. She said he maxed out his credit card and also had family help out. Also during this conversation, I had found out the army had chaptered him out of the military. I sent her the receipt and that was the last I ever heard from his side. Considering how far this went, do you think OP was justified in pushing it so far and making this guy have the international hold and pay up $80,000? Let me know yes or no and why in the comments down below. Our next story is by Aqua Marine, Husband and Me vs. Impatient D-Bag. This happened before quarantine and my work from home order. My husband, H, and I always drove separately to the gym from work and then we left together for home. One day while driving back home, I drove in front with him right behind me and in my rear view mirror I noticed a guy aggressively tailgating husband. We were already above the 35 miles per hour speed limit in a residential neighborhood and it was like this for a good 5 minutes on a one lane street. Normally husband isn't the one to get bothered by other drivers. In fact, I'm the one with road rage. So despite what was happening, I didn't think he cared about the guy who was bumper to bumper with him. He followed me at my pace. Not once did he press closer to me as if to pressure me to drive faster, so he maintained a safe distance the entire time. We all arrived at traffic lights where drivers commonly turned left onto another road, a two-lane street. Husband and I waited in the left lane as usual. It turned out that D-Bag needed to turn left too. The light flicked green, all three of us turned onto the new street. And that was when my body reacted before I even knew what I was doing. Some people know this, some don't. But when you're really in tune with someone, like a life partner or best friend, you start thinking the same way. I found the same mental wavelength as husband. We both knew that after that left turn, 90% of drivers want to take a right turn at the next immediate traffic light. So he and I passed into the right lane immediately and D-Bag took his opportunity and swerved into the left lane. I knew from previous experience on that road that he was going to try and cut in front of husband. So before D-Bag could cut back into the right lane, my foot eased off the gas, slowing my car, and I watched my rear view as husband pressed on his gas. In just a few seconds, we'd managed to eliminate any chance for D-Bag to cut in between. At the lights, I watched the green arrow for right turn become yellow. I turned right, husband turned right, and the light turned red, forcing D-Bag to stop. So I drove all the way home, grinning at my rear view at D-Bag who was forced to wait as traffic continued. When husband and I actually got home, I mentioned it to him, still surprised that we had pulled off something petty together, and we both laughed.
That's how you definitely know that they're a good couple. They're so in tune that they don't need to speak, they don't need to see each other eye to eye. They can just operate their vehicles in unison and pull off that pro revenge that they wanted to do. Our next story is by Wonderland's Finest Op. Hog all the parking at the top of the hill? Enjoy waiting to get out of the driveway? This happened years ago, back when I was still working residential health care. One of the houses that I worked at had a really steep driveway that led from the road up to the front door slash garage. There was room to park at the top of the driveway, in front of the entrance, and there was more than enough room for two cars to park side by side in this area. Since my shift was the overnight and usually involved arriving and leaving in the dark, and because my car had already been broken into once in that area, I was not comfortable with parking at the bottom of the hill. This usually wasn't an issue. Usually. Cue a co-worker whose name I couldn't remember if I tried. In addition to the healthcare work, she was also a correctional officer and had this I'm boss slash I'm better than you air about her, which explained why she liked to park her truck right in the middle of the parking area at the top of the hill, taking up both spots. I mentioned it to her two or three times that if she parked a bit further over to the right or left, we would both be able to park there and I wouldn't have to go through the process of parking at the bottom of the hill clocking in, waiting for her to leave, then going and moving my car to the safe location. She refused to change her parking habits, and I was getting increasingly frustrated by the petty behavior. One night, I was venting to my mother about the situation when she gave me the perfect solution. The next night, I was relieving this particular co-worker at this particular house. Sure enough, she had her truck hogging up the entire upper parking area. So I pulled my car right up behind hers, blocking her from pulling out. I clocked in, checked in with her about any important information about the clients, then excused myself to the bathroom while she got ready to leave. Less than 30 seconds after going into the bathroom, she's knocking at the door to inform me that my car is blocking her and I need to move it. Naturally, I act shocked. Oh no, you can't get around it? Shoot, I thought for sure I left enough room for you to get around it. Alright, so sorry about that. Just give me a minute and I'll be right out. I then proceeded to kick back and play on my phone for the next 10 minutes, leaving her standing outside the bathroom door with an attitude so strong I can practically feel it pulsing through the door. Once I decided she waited long enough, I made a show of flushing the toilet and washing my hands before finally going out and moving my car so she could leave. She was so pissed that she didn't say a single thing to me the entire time. I'll tell you one thing though, she learned her darn lesson and never took up both spots at the top of the hill again after that. I think this is only fair. They were being a complete jerk to you. There are two perfectly good spots that help ease your mind as far as security goes, and they gotta do this small package having truck driver compensating move and take up both parking spots. I'm all for teaching them their lesson very innocently like this. And our final story of the day is by McNuggeteer. She challenged me. So I work in a small office with a small parking lot. This morning, I parked in the front spot. During my break, I decided to go to Taco Bell because I know I'll be missing lunch because I gotta go shopping. My coworker, who was sitting in her car smoking at the time I left, saw me leave, and when I came back, she was in my previous spot. I don't say anything about this, but inside my mind, I'm like, alright, I see how it is, let's do this. Now, one thing about my job is that we all have different lunches scheduled and my coworker always goes home for lunch. She just happens to be one hour before me. So what do I do? I ask my boss to be excused for a second and immediately pull my car into the previous spot. Was it petty? Yes. Was it unnecessary? Yes. Do I regret it? Nah. And congrats, Chica, it's now my personal mission to always hold that spot. Update number one, so while I was at the store, she actually did move her car back to the front spot. So if there was ever any doubt that this wasn't personal, it is now. I don't know if this will be an unpopular opinion, 
But if it's a company parking lot or even a public parking lot, don't they have every right to move their car into a vacant spot as long as it's not reserved for somebody? Even if the person's going to be back in 15 to 30 minutes, or even upwards of an hour for that matter, don't they still have that right to be able to move their car there? I guess at the same time, OP has every right to be petty and try and take the spot back as much as they want to as long as it's vacant when they move their car. But with that being said, that's all the time we have for today. So which of these stories was your favorite and why? Let me know in the comments down below. But besides that, if you enjoyed the video, please consider liking and subscribing and turn notifications on if you haven't so you'll never miss an upcoming video. Any little thing that you do helps the channel grow so much more. Whether it's commenting, subscribing, or just watching the video, thank you all so very much for supporting me right here on the Storytime channel. I hope you all have a wonderful day and I'll see you all next time right here on the Storytime channel.